right, welcome everyone to this DCI roundtable. My name is Bo Hyden, and the mission of the Dynamic Competition Initiative is to develop and advance innovation-based dynamic competition theories, tools, and policy processes adjusted for the nature and pace of innovation in the 21st century. And all this is done for the benefit of society and the maintenance of an open democratic liberal order. Today's roundtable will focus on Carmelo Sanamo's recent paper titled Big Tech's Impact on Innovation Trajectories in Platform Markets, Understanding the Dynamic Relation Between Corporate Activities and Market Activities, where Carmelo and his co-authors look at the impact of mergers and acquisitions on startup activities and market reactions. Carmelo is currently the professor, is a professor at the Copenhagen Business School an affiliate professor of digital transformation at SDA Bocconi. Our two discussants for today are Aya Leipanen, who's a professor of applied economics and management at Cornell University, and Annabel Gower, who's a chair professor in digital economy and a director of the Center of Digital Economy at the University of Surrey. She's also a visiting professor at strategy and innovation at Oxford and is also working as an expert for the European Commission on Digital Platforms and Ecosystems. The format for, for this part of the roundtable will be that uh, Carmelo will give a presentation of his paper, followed by commentary by Aya and Annabelle, and then Carmelo will give some of his comments back on, on, on their commentary. And then we'll end the uh, public part of the presentation and go on to the roundtable. All right, so with that, Carmelo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, this is really luxury treatment, uh, I would say, uh, because I've got you know, not just one, but two discussions and, and two great one. So, um, and this is very much you know, uh, work in progress. Um, so we're basically still you know, doing analysis and working on the theory conceptualizations as we speak. Uh, this morning, I had again another round with uh, one of my co authors, Yang Yang Cheng, uh, who is also connected, a PhD student at Bocconi. And you know, my other co author is Claudio Panico, uh, professor at, at, uh, at Bocconi. Um, so, what is it we're trying to do here? Um, now, I mean, I don't have to inform or, or, or you know, spend a lot of time to uh, discuss what's going on. I mean, um, in this area with this group of people. Um, but you know, if if you look at the uh, recent concerns, right, that are with uh, around you know, the activities of M and A, particularly in the digital market, but particularly from you know by the incumbents and particularly digital big tech companies, um, we have the issues that you know, despite all the history that we have on literature on all the different uh, benefits that you might have or the different modalities that major acquisitions represent in terms of, you know, growth strategy for firms. Um, the concern here, uh, there is now, you know, there's a new emerging concern uh, from uh, regulators and, and, and many others that when it comes to the specific incumbents, um, you basically have um, an issues in the future market activities because of their uh, you know strong role in the influence of the market therefore any uh, possible gains or benefits of efficiencies that might be uh, obtained through the merger and acquisitions needs to be waived um, uh, seriously uh, against you know the potential harm to future uh, competitions or or you know the foreclosing of, of entire markets um, so this is not just the exercise of, uh, you know, of power over a market, but this is a really, you know, full control over the markets to the extent that then you will have no activity at all by any other firm. So that's the new kind of, you know, thinking when we are discussing the issues of big tech m &A activity. And if you want, right, I mean, this is a recent case where the, uh, for instance, the uh, CMA authority in the UK has, uh, you know, um, basically has blocked, what has not blocked, but has ordered uh, to undo the merger between Meta, Facebook, uh, and, and, and Giphy, um, precisely out of, out of this concern. Despite, you know, the fact that, you know, Giphy is, we might say, an irrelevant company, um, you know, when it comes to the um, uh, advertisement market, but you know the thinking is that 
Nonetheless, it has some functionalities that might attract to, even if it's a small niche of consumers in an adjacent market, uh, it might leverage that consumers to build you know, some user base and then on uh, different applications and therefore you know, uh, uh, building on that user base can actually provide some potential um, competition effect uh, back you know, to the core services of Facebook, right? And because of this concern, then, you know, big tech company might actually buy before, you know, the travel becomes real, right? And so that's the story that we currently goes under the label of killer acquisition. So uh, there is a, you know, a forging, if you want, of uh, what it's coming up as an understanding of a dynamic competition theory of harms. Uh, when we're looking at this uh, M&A, where dynamic competition is understood really as future possible competition from nowadays, not yet a competitor. Um, so uh, what we have here is basically different different theories. Um, uh, and um, sorry, I was looking at a message, but that's not directed to me. Um, okay, so. Um, what we have here, we have basically the story of the uh, killer acquisitions that, you know, for digital market, it's actually, um, you know, it doesn't really apply squarely uh, because that was, you know, uh, more for a study that has to do uh, with, uh, you know, uh, firms in the, in the pharmaceutical industry um, uh, where, you know, incumbents basically acquire startups just to kill their innovation projects. And therefore, you know, kill potential future competition to their own products. Now, why that, you know, is that applying to the pharmaceutical industry? Precisely because there is a long process to get there. So it's not about the future, if you want, but it's more about the past. So all the, you know, R and D process that gets, you know, to the patenting of that uh, particular uh, new, uh, you know, innovation that therefore gets the innovation itself. Uh, you know, um, uh, some rents, right? I mean, the rights to extract this rent through the patent after when it is launched into the market. Now, we know that we don't have that in digital markets, so it, it's hard to think, you know, of a possible similar mechanism um, as, you know, uh, uh, incentives to kill, right, innovation, because one can say that, in fact, I mean, this, if any, would work the other way around in digital markets. Because, you know, uh, big tech are, incentivized to buy any possible potential, uh, you know, uh, future competitor in the market, you know, there might be actually an incentive to keep producing these innovations uh, to start with so that they get uh, buy out by big tech companies, right? So, so there will be a, a continuous stream of these innovations, uh, you know, to the market precisely to exploit, uh, you know, these uh, distortive incentives of big tech companies. So, you know, the argument can go, can go both ways. But you know, what is instead, I mean, more of the logic that applies to the specific digital markets is rather the kill zone, the so-called kill zone effect, right? Now the kill zone is slightly different because the story here is that, you know, the investment or the M&A activity, when you acquire a company in a particular uh, technological space or market segment, what this does is it's killing the exact incentives of investors, other investors, such as venture capitalists, to support any startups, um, any other startups in that particular market domain or technology domain, uh, just because of, out of the fear that you know they will face a tough competition with the dominant platform, either with the dominant platforms, integrated service, or with the you know target companies or with the acquired company from from the from the big tech and therefore you know you have basically the story that there is depressed if you want uh, area of investment precisely this so you know they kind of avoid that sort of investments so they will escue away from those investments and then look you know to uh, for other opportunities because that becomes basically too risky for them to, to support so this is more of the, you know, this is this, the kill zone effect, which suggests that basically any M&A, um, you know, uh, will have then this uh, de facto foreclosure of future competition because, you know, it will, it will basically prevent, you know, investors to support any, any startup activity. So um, there is also, though, um, you know, a story that runs contrary to this, which is, you know, the that actually M and A may provide an innovation zone to the extent that big tech acquisitions provide in, instead incentives for uh, you know startups to to innovate, and this might happen 
uh, fundamentally for two for two mechanisms. You know, one is that again because it's it's hard to transfer you know the knowledge in digital markets because of the lack of IP or, or proper control rights. The best way is by selling the the entire assets, right? I mean, so the company. And that's the way to monetize. So again, the exit strategy in selling, so seeing the, the, the M&A as the exit strategy for this startup is actually the, the right incentive to, um, for innovation uh, in this market. Uh, and therefore, you know, having M&A activity will provide basically an exit strategy, which will provide you know, those incentives. The other mechanism that can actually be that, um, you know, startups may start innovating around the core technology that the platform or the incumbent firms, right, is invested in. And so basically there could be, you know, uh, a start of an emerging market or for complementary or other applications around that technology just because of the, of the M&A activity by the incumbent. So that is basically, you know, initiating new uh, innovation trajectories, if you want. Now, um, that is, you know, the kind of different views in the literature so far. And uh, uh, what are what do we see, uh, you know, as possible uh, limitations of this uh, of this view is that you know uh, what looks like you know a dynamic perspective on this you know on on, on competition so future competition. If we look carefully, is rather you know static. It's 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 really you no know, sort of comparative static between uh, you know of activities uh, that happen after right i mean the the m a activity so they look at essentially as it, as it shows here on the graph right you you will basically look at what happened after after the m a and if you see that you know there is less entry for instance right after that you will detect this as being m a being anti-competitive if you said you know you see that there is actually more entry this will be you know pro-competitive the fact is that you know we need to second guess of what the underlying causal mechanism can be here, and we can only observe you know what ha what happens after the M and A, but we cannot really observe you know what the M and A has to do really with the you know likelihood of entry of those uh, um, of those firms. As the arguments go, right for the kill zone and the innovation zone, both effects can really happen, uh, but we don't really know when. Uh, these effects, you know, are going to happen and, and why they will happen. Um, what is, you know, really um, one of the disturbing fact here is that it's about, you know, the counterfactual that, you know, uh, competition is sort of assumed that is going to exist, right, independently of any activities, right, of these firms in the market. And that is something that we cannot really test. And, it, and you know, I'm not quite sure uh, is actually a tenable assumption because, you know, incumbents have a profound effect in influencing and shaping, you know, the market um, in a given sector um, and therefore, you know, making actually the market emerging in many cases. And that provides the humus, if you want, for many startups to enter and then explore with different applications, right? So, so if you want, said differently, uh, many times incumbent activities have an educational uh, what you know, what startups or investors will tell you, right? I mean, they they educate the market, so they create the market by educating the customers about you know the applications of particular project, uh, product, and activities, and that you know might actually stimulate then you know startups to come in and explore with you know related applications or or better in terms of quality of functionality of applications. Now, um, what is um, what is you know uh, what we think should rather be a different way of look at this is that we really don't know anything that happens before the m a takes place right um and so that assumption that before m a there is you know a sort of a stable uh, you know environment where every anything is not affected and then is the m a the right you know shock to the market that affects or disrupts right i mean the incentives either to invest and therefore support innovation or you know the uh, uh the disincentives right i mean to support you know startups in that particular area um this is actually what we think is it's a sort of a black box at the moment and it needs to be you know unboxed um now if you take for instance you know a standard view in innovation um about the entire right i mean life cycle and particularly when it comes to the you know dominant design uh, literature 
um, we, we know that in fact, I mean, it's innovation or getting to that innovation or a particular innovation trajectory for technology is a much more complex story, right? And there is a lot of experimentations at the beginning of alternative designs that might work, might not work, nobody knows uh, for the simple reason that this is innovation. And the more you know, you, you, you land into uncharted territory, the less you know about what consumers want. So, you know, in many cases, there is not even a market for, for such, you know, uh, technologies because the market gets created with, you know, the use case of the particular technology. So imagine in those particular cases, right? I mean, you really navigate with uh, no uh, reference points. And, and this is, you know, very, uh, it's not even risky for investors, but it's uncertain, right? I mean, they cannot, they cannot even attach a probability to those innovations. And therefore, you know, they have to put really bets on these different designs, right? So there's all sorts of experimentations around, around, this, around this. And then a certain point as the uh, literature on dominant design goes, right? I mean, there is some convergences. There are some uh, factors right, that might tip you know, the market or, or selections towards some, some particular uh, valuable or functional you know, uh, design. And then all of a sudden, you know, those become uh, sort of, of the adopted you know, uh, design. And, and that's how you know, a standard will, will emerge at a certain point, right, when there is this convergence. Now, what that literature is very informative about is that there is a really uh, you know, a turning point between whether you enter pre, you know, the definition of the design or when you enter, you know, after the design uh, has become, you know, a standard, right? So after this, after design become a standard, the game is sort of over, right? So then competition becomes between products that share the standard. And so it's competition within standards. But before that, you know, a design becomes a standard, right? There is a lot of uncertainty and there is competition between alternative possible, you know, standards in the making, right? So that's where you, you there is there is a period in between you know the fermentation period where there is really early exploration and you know the post uh, the standardization period where you know a design has been selected that it's when there is you know max entry of firms right and then you know uh, after that I mean you you have the typical shake off in the industry now if we take basically this view right I mean this suggests that focus should not just be on what happened post an m a because m a can actually be understood as a selection mechanism where it's not the market selected, but it's actually a powerful incumbent that has an influence on the market. And therefore, after that, right, I mean, we might naturally expect that, you know, the sort of life cycle has ended because now there is a standard in the market and therefore, you know, we might expect a shake sh 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 off, right, in the industry. What is interesting to, uh, to understand, right, it's what's happening before that. Right? How do we get to that selection? Is it, you know, the incumbents really influencing this activity and in which terms, right? Both still and negative. That's what we're trying to basically get with this paper. Now, let me, let me anchor the discussion into two specific examples, just to give you an idea what this life cycle might look like, right? When, um, in terms of investments and, uh, you know, in this case. Now, take you know, for instance, this example of uh, Songza, which is a uh, music streaming uh, services. Now, this uh, you know startups was funded, and it's part of our sample, um, so it's in the data. It, it was founded right in uh, November two thousand seven. Then you know received first investments uh, in a first you know VC round in two thousand eleven, and this, there was no you know GAFAM in, involved into that. But in the same, you know, market segment that where, you know, Songa uh, was, right? I mean, GAFAM, of course, I mean, they were already looking and searching for, and indeed in 2013, you know, they received uh, in the second round investment some, uh, some, some, some money, right? I mean, uh, funding from, from Amazon. Um, however, um, was not Amazon buying out, you know, the company later on, but it was indeed, in fact, I mean, Google, right? So there is also some sequential here that has to do with, competition between, you know, uh, big tech, you know, companies for acquiring, you know, this valuable technologies out there, right? So as you can see here, there is a whole cycle of investment uh, first before you actually get, you know, to the selection process out there, right? And then the acquisition. Now, a different story that has to do with the much, you know, discussed or debated uh, Facebook, Instagram acquisition, 
uh, you know, now this is like the quintessential example of the miss, right? I mean, killer acquisition as, as they go. Is it really the case? Um, now, if you look at what happened to, to Instagram, um, you know, so Facebook was already active and searching and, you know, trying to experiment, you know, with technologies in that uh, kind of market segment, which is, you know, application software market segment, right? And they, in fact, invested in uh, this company called, you know, Lucky, Lucky Car, whatever, right? And so they did something similar, if you want, to what, you know, Instagram was doing in terms of technology applications. And then, as you can see here, they follow up, you know, on this investment. And then a certain point, actually, Instagram entered, right? I mean, this market, right? And so it was founded in 2010, after two years since, you know, that first investment of Facebook in this application uh, segment. And, 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 you know, uh, they received, you know, money from other investors. And afterward, um, you know, Facebook realized that this was actually, uh, you know, the design that could become the standard. And they rather shift, you know, the investment from their early, uh, you know, uh, seed investments on Lucky, on Lucky Cal to, to, to Instagram, and they decided to buy it, right? And then, you know, we know then what happened afterwards. Now, this is uh, this, the approach we, we basically are, are taking in this paper, right? So we actually want to look at the sequential events and see what happens, not just, you know, when the M&A, of course, but what happens also to the other you know, uh, earlier uh, stages of the innovation development um, uh, where, you know, all, uh, where GAFAM uh, are involved in terms of uh, corporate activity. So uh, we basically take it on an event study approach to look at the impact of these investments, you know, and then we look basically at the affected companies and by affected companies, we, we're gonna look at both direct and indirect competitor, but I'll get there in a second. What are the periods that we're looking at is, is again, right? I mean, this fermentation, selection, and standardization um, uh, understanding of uh, period, right? Where we kind of parallel with the first CVC event, um, uh, and then, you know, the last round of CVC event, and finally the m &A event, okay? Um, so we take those as, you know, the significant events that are kind of punctuating, uh, you know, this evolution uh, across, across uh, the um, innovation trajectory. So, you know, let me show you what we got so far, right? I mean, and, and again, it's very preliminary. Uh, I, I apologize. It's, it's written everywhere just as a reminder that, you know, uh, this is not the analysis written in the stones, uh, but, you know, actually it's just the beginning. All right, so just the clarifications of, you know, when I speak, you know, what is that I'm referring to? Now, the corporation for us is the corporate activities that are undertaken by incumbents, right? And we are referring here, we're looking at two classes of incumbents, the GAFAM, you will see GAMAF, you know, because Yang Yang puts GAMAF, I always tend to say GAFAM. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, basically the five, you know, big tech companies um, and versus, right, the non, GAFAM, you know, uh, incumbents. This might still be, you know, big companies out there, also tech companies, maybe, you know, Oracle, whatever, but, you know, they are not the ones that are under the spotlight. So we look at those activities on target company. Now, the target company here is any startup that has received either, you know, CVC, so corporate venture capital investment from those companies, or they have been acquired by those companies. Now, this becomes our reference point in the analysis for us, because then, you know, we're going to look at direct and indirect competitors of this company, right? So the potentially affected uh, competitors, okay? So this will be the affected A and affected B group, okay? How do we build this? Uh, we have a procedure that we follow. So we use some, you know, use a large data set from PitchBook and PitchBook has a measure that is, you know, it's a similarity score. It looks at, you know, it does some text analysis and it looks at uh, product characteristics and the market where they are, you know, a bunch of, of, of factors of descriptors of the, of the company. And then it, it constructs this similarity index um, of the component technology. And it can run between zero and a hundred, okay? Where hundred is, you know, they are, pretty much the same. So we basically, and then it comes up with the top 10, you know, most similar companies and it gives a score. Now, 
Clearly, this has a limitation because also other studies have just looked at this top 10 list. But of course, this is a sensor sample, right? I mean, there might be other, there might be 20 or 50, right? I mean, similar companies, but PitchBook will just tell, give you, you know, the 10 most similar. So how do we avoid, you know, this censoring of the sample? What we do is in step one, we match, you know, the target to the most, the 10, you know, most similar companies. Then in step two, what we do, we take each of these company and we look for the 10 most similar companies to each of them to see, you know, what are their other companies that are similar to, uh, to these companies. And so we basically come up, you know, with this other larger sample. Out of this sample, then we create now the focal A and the focal B group, where the focal A are, you know, companies that are, uh, you know, very similar to the target. Um, either in step, both in step one and step two, and that's the direct competitors and companies that are similar to the, to the, you know, to the, to the target, but to a less extent. So, you know, this might be actually what we call indirect competitors because they share some similarities in terms of technology, but, you know, they might have different applications, right? So they might look maybe a different focus. So it's still AI applied to images, but, you know, instead of being applied to medical, whatever service might be applied to, uh, I don't know, something else, you know, camera security, so for instance, right? So it's an indirect competitor because obviously technologies will allow you to, you know, share some uh, features and user base, but, but obviously it has, you know, some differences. So it's not really a close substitute. So that's basically how we created these two companies, uh, sorry, these two group of affected companies. Um, and then, you know, we look basically with this uh, event study approach um, at these three different, uh, you know, events, right? And, and so we have the free market basically activities. So there is, you know, uh, where we have, we look basically at new entry and new financing, right? Um, on the affected uh, company. Um, and then we, um, we look at that, you know, what happens before the event and after the event. So compared to the static approach where they just look, you know, at the difference, you know, after, you know, compared to before, we actually take, you know, this more dynamic econometric approach to look at, is there some anticipations of the effects, right? So, so you know, M&A do not happen overnight, right? I mean, there, so there is, there is a informations and we might expect all you know, that to happen. Therefore, there might be anticipations about this and, and you know, what happens afterwards. Okay, so, Having said that, let me just show you a couple of, uh, you know, some descriptives, which might be even more informative perhaps, you know, than, than the actual uh, regressions analysis. Um, so we focus on, so on the software market uh, segmentation. Um, and this is, um, uh, you know, vertical, uh, how you want to call it. And for the following reason, because, you know, this is where most of the um, uh, activities by the big tech companies uh, have happened. Um, and in fact, I mean, when we look at all the CBC and m and activities that are out there, more than 32%, so, um, you know, is accounted for by, by the software market uh, vertical. And about, you know, 90% of, uh, you know, uh, the target affected companies that are founded since 2000, right, uh, out of our categorizations are in this segment. So we're pretty much, you know, covering uh, the, the, you know, the bulk of the activities. And, you know, we are doing just on this because we want to exclude, you know, uh, comparing stuff uh, uh, with other industries that might be, you know, not closely related. Now, within the software market segmentation, then we have obviously sub segments, right? I mean, and you have uh, the examples here. You know, we can have application software, business productivity software, social platform software, et cetera, et cetera, right? So those are basically, you know, very specific, uh, um, you know, applications of the technology. And here you have, you know, um, on the left, the number of companies that in each of these sub segments have received, you know, have been acquired by uh, Gapan firm. Um, that's the actual number. And, um, and, you know, to the right, you, you can also appreciate the number of investments that, uh, you know, uh, Gapan firms have uh, conducted in this sector in, in the form of uh, corporate venture capital, right? So, um, 
so as you can see, there is a, you know, a, a activity. It's not a one-to-one. -one, so it's not that every time that they make a, an acquisition, they have you know, uh, come up with earlier investment, but there is a significant, you know, this is just to show that there is significant activity uh, also uh, prior to the prior to the M and A. Um, here you have some more. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, here you have some more descriptives of, you know, top investors, and this is the, across you know all the different sectors, not just software. Um, and, and here again, among the corporate venture capital investors, you know, uh, three of the five uh, big tech companies figures among the top fifteen, right, in terms of. Uh, number of deals that they have conducted so microsoft being you know the most active um and when we look you know, at the right side uh among the top 15 acquirers uh you can see that you know they are very much you know at the top um although you have other you know tech companies such as oracle intel and others that that you know they are they are good runner up out there okay so this is just you know um the the numbers overall now, here's you know our findings. Um, first, we replicated um, you know uh, previous analysis that uh, on the that has done you know on the kill zone, so come and pile and call paper. Um, and so this is basically static different difference analysis, and um, the comparable um, here column is column uh, six, so the last one. Uh, where we look, you know, at the financing size, so the amount of investment that is put, you know, in startups after an acquisition by uh, GAFAM. Okay, so in the common Pali paper, they only look at Facebook and Google, uh, and only for specific treasures of, uh, of companies. We look at all GAFAM, and we do find, you know, results that are similar to what they have. Um, so, you know, that there is a negative effect on the follow-up investment after, you know, an M&A is conducted uh, by GAFAM in that particular technology uh, segment. Uh, no surprising, right? Um, however, what we find is that, you know, uh, there is also actually a positive effect on the margin on new entry after M&A. And this is very surprising. And also, you know, there's some positive effect also on new financing. Now, in terms of amount of money, you know, the effect is negative as in common Pali. But, you know, if, if we look at new money, new investments, and we look at new entry, actually, there, is a, there seems to be a, there is a positive effect, right? And so this is surprising, but, you know, we actually would expect that to the extent that, you know, there might be competition. Uh, for uh, acquiring other, you know, startups that are similar in functionalities among, you know, the incumbents, right? So there may be actually a race, you know, to have similar technologies. And so that might explain, you know, some of these results. If we look in dynamic terms, now our event, uh, you know, study, our event analysis, um, uh, what, if we focus on entry, here is, you know, some of the results we obtain. If we look just at the first, you know, CVC um, uh, effect, what we see here, I just, you know, focus maybe on column three and six, which is the full model. Um, you know, what we see here is that there is some anticipation effect for entry in the first CVC. So, you know, that fermentation period, right? It's happening around already, you know, the CVC investment. So in the pre uh, one year, right? Uh, before the actual event. And there is, you know, entry after, the um, uh, the event so you know CVC seems to boost really um, uh, the affected company both you know the direct group A and you know uh, group B um, this is you know instead when we look at the last run of CVC you know uh, it, it seems here that actually the, there is a constraining effect on entry right so when there is a, this selection and then and therefore you know uh, there's sort of convergency among uh, what seems to be the winning or about to win in you know, our technology. We see already that there is, you know, a kind of plateau, and you don't see actually additional entry. To the contrary, you actually see, you know, uh, a slow rate of entry, and, and this may turn actually negative. And this is both for direct and indirect, you know, uh, potential competitors. Um, when looking at M&A, again, we, we see, you know, a negative overall effect um, after, um, the, um, after the M&A, although, you know, results here are, are very shaky, so they are not quite significant. 
Um, so uh, if any, you know, we don't really see a very statistically significant or robust effect. If you want to, to have, you know, an appreciation in terms of a quantification of this, um, these are, you know, kind of the projected uh, different uh, cards. Um, and so, you know, basically what we get here with the results is that about 40% of, uh, of all the, uh, you know, companies that uh, uh, of the group uh, A, right? So direct competitors that enter after the first CVC event, right? Um, while, you know, uh, indirect competitors group B, there's about 30% of them entering after the first CVC event. And then this numbers, you know, slow. Uh, I mean, so gets lower for the addition for the for the for the following up events. Uh, but you know, it's still interesting to see that M and A still stimulates some, uh, you know, significant uh, percentage of entry uh, here, right? I mean, about you know, fifteen percent. Although, as I said, um, um, obviously the results are are a bit shaky there, so we cannot really uh, distinguish now. There is no way you can see, you know, all of this uh, here. And also in the interest of time, let me sum up here what happens in terms of financing, because here we find, um, you know, different effects depending on the stage and depending on the group. So I will just summarize, you know, here. Uh, so in the selection period, um, what we see is that, you know, uh, the last, you know, CVC, uh, it actually increases the new financing of direct competitors. So direct competitors, you know, receives a kind of a boosted, you know, financing. And that's basically a push, you know, probably to, for, you know, a runner up, you know, to then to the, to that exit strategy, but, you know, decreases uh, new finances for indirect competitors. So again, it's this idea that, you know, there's much of a focus and attention on the convergency towards, you know, what, potentially becoming you know, the standard that is going to be picked up in the market, right? And therefore, there is a lot of focus on those direct competitors um, uh, from, from investors. While in the standardization period, uh, what we see, um, you know, is that actually M&A significantly increases new financing for the affected companies. Again, right? So the affected company receives new money although the size might, might actually be lower than, than before, but actually they receive new investment, right? And, and, and this might also be because, uh, again, as I said, um, uh, you know, there might be actually a race or expected for those competitors also to be acquired or to become, you know, um, uh, valuable companies uh, in, in terms of the market application. So I'll conclude with, um, you know, some considerations uh, uh, out of this preliminary findings, right? So, so what, right? I mean, what are we gonna do about this? I think, you know, there are, there are a few, uh, few implications that come out already by, uh, from this. Uh, so the first is that, you know, um, there really is a narrow focus, right? And very strong assumptions about, you know, how this market develop, about the existing, right? I mean, uh, theories or, uh, of, of harms, right? I mean, about dynamic competition, they're looking off fast forward and you know forget about to reassess you know how do we get there right i mean so are do we are we really gonna have those potential innovations out there competing with this right if we remove right i mean these activities from incumbents the second is about the actual the findings that we have here about the cbc role right so the influential positive role that they have in attracting uh, both you know entry and money for startups, right? Um, when they when they start investing in, in, in one target, right? So so B tech actually, you know, they sort of become market makers, right? Because they start shaping these innovation paths, and so you know they they might actually drive you know the market activity. Now this is positive if you see from this from this uh, um, uh, uh, perspective. But you know, my question could be: Is this uh, really you know a positive or negative when we when we look you know in terms of uh, the potential implications, right? I mean, uh, for uh, for competition because, right? I mean, on the positive side, this is you can see them as you know orchestrating innovation evolution that otherwise might not even happen. On the negative side, this can actually be also uh, an attempt to you know, select even ex ante, right, before actually they even emerge, right, I mean, in entirely, you know, trajectories of innovation. So in other words, they shape the innovation that they actually want, right, I mean, through their activities, and they invite actually investors and startups to explore and experiment in that area. 
Um, and therefore, right, I mean, they, they build in, in innovations in, in the sense that then, you know, they might select uh, out, right? Um, and so the third implication is that, you know, whether we should, again, you know, look just at future competition and how do we guess, you know, when is going to turn future competition or whether instead we should actually focus on other type of failures that it's that are related with the innovation process. And if we do that, right, um, we should look at this innovation based type of competition um, in technology segments rather than looking at, you know, what happened afterwards in a given market. I'll stop here um, and I very much look forward, you know, for uh, the reactions um, out there. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Carmelo. Thanks for the sneak peek into your preliminary findings. Um, and now um, I'd like to invite our first discussant, Aya Leipanen. Yeah, thank you, Carmelo, for that really interesting um, presentation and, and uh, paper. Um, the, the paper is indeed not super advanced, so there's a... a I'm sort of talking a little bit around it and and uh, hopefully we'll have a good conversation around these topics because these topics are important and and very 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 topical. Um, okay, so the the issue that that uh, Carmelo and Yang and uh, Claudio are trying to address is that that big tech in uh, software um, in the software area has acquired a lot of companies and and so what are the implications for innovation and competition and and the dynamics of it? So um, I think that the, the kind of traditional concern is that acquisition decreases competition in the industry, and so innovation might go down if they lock up resources. But then in this uh, software market, um, a lot of startups are, are started with the, with the very idea that they would be acquired down the line by big tech or some other company. And so that's, that's a strong motivator of innovation in the first place. And then perhaps there's... So the software market is very potentially special. And so possibly there's um, actually more entry when, the, when someone acquires a company and kind of pulls away, um, sort of combines some um, activities in that market. Maybe there's room for others to enter and, and uh, grow. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but it, it depends on entry barriers. So I think entry barriers are one big question here. And then, um, and then uh, Carmel a little bit referred to um, the idea of kind of validating the market or legitimizing the marketplace. And, and so that is a big issue in, especially in emerging uh, market set up, um, market settings. Um, and so if there's a lot of uncertainty and a big company um, puts uh, money into that, that validates that there's going to be a market. So that can be also a strong uh, motivator for entry and, and investment. Oh, I actually wanted to um, mention on the right here, it's a little bit maybe difficult to see it if you have a small screen, but it's just a kind of um, illustration of Google's acquisitions. Um, so there's the blue ones are Google's services and uh, red and green are products and other activities, but the top ones are some of the major acquisitions that Google has made over the years. And if you look at the, the names here, Nest, Waze, Motorola Mobile, that was IP, um, Nevo, YouTube, Android. There's just some major products that are currently Google's products um, originated from acquired technology. So a lot of Google's business has, has been built a lot on acquisitions. Okay, so what um, happened in the paper? Um, well, looking at the CDC activity and, and acquisitions by GAFAM, GAMAF, <laughs> those big tech platforms. So there was a lot of have surprising positive effects on entry and venture financing for other similar startup, startups or um, pretty similar or related startups. Um, and, and there was some comparison between the, the GAFAM companies and non-GAFAM um, activities in, the, in this market. Um, some differences across the, or between the direct competitors versus other similar firms and, um, entry and financing impacts. And so I did not yet see a, a clear pattern that I was able to understand, but it's first draft. So starting some conversations kind of what to look into in this setup. Uh, it's, it's really um, interesting. The challenges in this uh, research with these data, um, just some of the things that I'm sure you guys are looking into, the measurement questions, I will talk a little bit about those. What is similar, what is a similar firm and how can you, can you trust the pitch book? 
Um, text analysis, um, what is entry here? Is it entry into pitch book or is it entry into the market? Um, and then I think I, I would need more sort of um, conceptual conceptualization around why comparing GAFAM against non-GAFAM. The, the non-GAFAM could, could also be platform companies, maybe they're smaller, but they might be still powerful in some sub-markets. And so, so is it big platforms versus small platforms or what is the comparison going on here? Um, and the, um, there's always an endogeneity question. So what, what, is, what is a general market move? And can other GAFAM companies actually move in the market um, as sort of original um, actors or, or um, exogenous um, drivers of it? Or, or um, is, it, is it all just sort of general market movement? So you would need to, need to clarify and be able to identify the, the true role of these, these uh, large companies. Um, and then I was also unclear about the life cycle. Is it really, can we really say that there's a product life cycle or is it just some um, innovation that's maturing? That might not mean that there's an industry and market that's really um, uh, maturing along with that product that you're looking at. So pinning down the, the life cycle stages, if, if, any, if that's the way it ends up going. But more, uh, let's put that aside because it is early, early work. Um, and so I think the interesting question here is that, so if we're looking at software-based markets, so is there something special about these platform companies um, that their acquisitions and their uh, venture investments that is impacts the markets differently than what we were used to thinking in terms of uh, <clears throat> product markets or particularly there was that very influential work by Cunningham et al on killer acquisitions, but that was in pharmaceuticals, very different context. And I think you guys are um, correct in, in taking explicitly into account that software has a different kind of an IPU regime. Um, appropriability is just much more limited than in pharmaceuticals. Um, there's you know, people patent a lot, but it's easy to um, design around those patents. And so the, the acquisition being a method of tra technology transfer. Um, but there's also um, a lot of limitation um, going on. And so if Google is considering entering into a market, they could acquire a company or they could just do it themselves. And they have a lot of resources and they can do a lot of imitation and they do that all the time. And so as an, as an ex, um, example of that, Instagram and Snapchat, Snapchat started to gain traction and become popular among, I guess, uh, young adults. Um, Instagram did not go and and try to acquire Snapchat, they just developed the same features and undermined um, the kind of momentum of Snapchat in the market. Um, <clears throat> uh, patenting some of these really kind of um, pretty simple features or protecting via patents can be really difficult. But then contrast that to Waze and Google. So Google went ahead and, and bought acquired Waze and why would they do that? It's, it's a piece of software, but it also came with a network of users. So lots of people had the Waze app in their phones already and were, were feeding data into the service. And that was really valuable um, and worth acquiring for Google. Okay, so how does this all matter? Is it good for consumers or bad for consumers if, if we see Google buying Waze? Well, if Google is actually really good at scaling innovations and making them available, um, Android, YouTube. Um, I think there's an argument to be made that the, the, these services or these uh, software inventions were much more commercially successful with Google than they would have been on their own. Um, but then there can be um, examples of restricting supply or charging high prices. And just yesterday, we got this uh, um, piece of news coming out about the double click. Um, and, or advertising technology issues for Google. So this, this just out, um, US uh, Department of Justice sued Google for alleged antitrust violations in ad tech. And this is explicitly about um, acquisitions in the ad tech space. Having inserted itself to all aspects of digital advertising, Google has used anti-competitive exclusionary unlawful means to, um, to uh, eliminate threats to its dominance. Um, the power 
rivals say that Google's power stems from a series of acquisitions, including DoubleClick and a bunch of others. And the DOJ is asking the court to unwind Google's anti-competitive acquisitions and prevent the company from obtaining similar dominance in the future. So it's very dominant in the ad market, has used acquisitions to gain access to technology that is very beneficial and, and then blocking others from using those same technologies um, as it did that. Um, so interesting, um, kind of different, kind of a software market and what is, what specifically if, is double click technology that others are not able to invent uh, similar technologies for themselves. I don't know that case. I think it's, a, it's worth looking into. But so I think my, um, my discussion really kind of, um, or my thinking about this sort of really revolves around the, the software IP regime being really a fundamental feature. And it seems that the acquisition makes much more sense if there are patents or other resources that, that the, the acquirer can control through that acquisition, like that Waze network or some other relationships or, or um, user um, activities. And so one might even claim that killer acquisitions per se don't exist in pure software because they might, even imitation might just be too, too easy for uh, rivals to do if you just buy a piece of software and keep it, keep it um, blocked up that might not prevent its um, entry into the marketplace. So if entry barriers are low or in areas of software where entry barriers are low, acquisitions that reduce competition might actually spur entry and get others excited about uh, going into that space. Um, then um, there's that question about similarity. And so if a big tech acquires something that, um, that does manage to kind of um, reduce competition and lock up resources, then the effects should be different for very similar kind of substitute startups versus those others who might provide complementary services related to that. And I think um, identifying who is who can be very, very tricky empirically. Um, but overall, it just seems that it's, it, it's really difficult to say something super clear and generalizable in software markets because there's so many, um, so many issues going on at the same time. So measurement is a real big, big issue here, but it's a great topic, super timely and lots of open questions. So thank you for inviting me to talk about this and, and think about this. Great. Thanks so much. I, I think it is interesting to think, are you buying the technology or are you buying, again, the little platform that's already accumulated a lot of users, the, the network effects, right? And, and when do they do that and when don't they do that to get to the data and other things? All right, great. Next up is uh, Annabelle Gower. Annabelle, are you ready? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, very good. Uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me. And I don't have any slides, so I will just talk and... Uh... Um, and I will um, first of all start by uh, congratulating uh, Carmelo and co-authors on a very interesting piece of research. Yes, it's an early, it's an early version of a paper, but uh, there's a lot to like in the paper, and uh, and I have some comments about what perhaps might be worth, um, you know, either revisiting or digging a little bit deeper. And I thought the comments by Aya were fabulous, really interesting. Um, so first, what I really like about the paper is that it, it really tries to take seriously the notion of dynamic competition. And uh, it, uh, it tries to look at the effect of not just the, the act of M&A, but to situate that temporally within a broader time frame uh, that would start with the other activities uh, um, such as uh, corporate venture activity. And so it expands uh, the analysis uh, along along a, a time frame, uh, making a hypothesis that there is a, a series of activities that are linked to each other, and that somehow M and A would be the end of a sequence of activity, which is an interesting hypothesis. And what I also like is to expand the focus of analysis from not not just individual products or, or, or 
uh, the acquisition of, a, of, of individual companies, but to try to think in more aggregate terms on uh, the effect of, uh, of uh, the sector. And that's where you speak about the industry life cycle or what we call the, you call the theory of dominant design. So, so I say hooray for, for, for all of this, okay? And I think we need a lot more research and carefully empirical research, careful empirical research on those topics if we want to make progress of, on those very important questions which, which uh, have economic uh, importance and societal importance. So I, I'm a big fan. Now, uh, on the details of the paper, I have, I have some questions. And I hope they will be uh, helpful for you as you take the paper further. The first one has to do with um, the product uh, life cycle. Uh, so a theory, a theory of uh, you know from from innovation studies. Uh, I had the the joy to study with uh, with Jim Utterback, which was one of the main uh, writers in this um, in this uh, line of work. Uh, you know, and you cite all the right people there, Tushman, at the back, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of it come, came from MIT. I, I have a doubt that what you're observing are really um, industry life cycles. Okay. So we speak about life cycle, but the paper is a little bit sloppy as to defining exactly the being and the end. And I think I saw a, I saw a comment in, uh, in, um, in Aya, uh, in Aya's uh, uh, commentary about that. And uh, and I think we, 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 we are reacting to the same issue here. Uh, the theory of dominant design, you know, that uses the word ferment, emergence of dominant design, et cetera, affects entire sectors. And, and that theory was built on looking at the emergence of entire industries. So examples would be looking at the emergence of the automobile industry, you know, would have a, a cycle like that with ferment, where you would have hundreds and hundreds of companies trying to invent and figure out what will an automobile look like? What should we even call an automobile, right? And, you know, and when you go to a museum of the early models of automobiles, um, it, it is incredible, the, the variety of designs that existed uh, compared to the design that we see today. And I, th and I, and I worry a little bit that in, in, in this version of the paper, uh, what you are talking about, you know, you identify something that has a beginning, a middle, and the end. And yes, there may be some variation around a around the design features of a particular product, but I'm not exactly sure that this is what the theory of dominant design uh, and um, and the, the, the industry life cycle is about. And I think that there is a little bit of a of a of a lack of clarity, at least in this version of the paper, as to the unit of analysis. So whether you are looking at a particular product market or whether you're looking at an entire industry or sector. Now, even if the, the theory of dominant design and industry life cycles may have been built and developed and used mostly in much broader you know, uh, settings, it doesn't mean there's nothing applicable potentially to this particular question. But I just think in, in the writing of the paper and in your own thinking, it would be helpful to be more specific about that. Um, Another point I have is to take seriously the notion of innovation in complements versus innovation in substitutes. You allude to that in the in the beginning of the paper, and then you focus on you know the the competitive effect of entry, right? But actually, as as you know, you mentioned it briefly in the introduction. It is very clear that there are strong incentives for an incumbent to prevent innovation on substitutes that would dethrone. The, the incumbent, and there are strong incentives for an incumbent, uh, platform or not, by the way, to encourage innovation on complements. Okay, now platform firms, and we know that for already more than twenty years, are firms that tend to specifically encourage innovation in complements, and they make product design decisions such as you know opening up interfaces, or such as APIs, or or uh, or um, or uh, uh, you know, create developers conferences or give away software developers kits for free, specifically to do what you, what you call here shaping innovation trajectories, and that's something that has been already seen and understood and analyzed. You know, as far as my own uh, you know uh, first book in two thousand two, we speak about that uh, a lot. 
right? That it is a deliberate activity that is well recognized that yes, of course, big tech are market shapers. They're platform firms, and in particular, they, they, they're platforms so that, 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 that have an innovation platform aspect to them. So what I would like to see, you see, in the next version of the paper is the effect of the various activities that you have identified, corporate venture, as well as M&A, on innovation, specifically on substitutes, on complements, and perhaps a third category that is products that, like Instagram was, start their life as a substitute, as a complement, but could become the next platform in the next form factor, in the next in the next arena where the platform competition is going to happen. And some analysts today are wondering, for example, if you know Facebook acquisition in in um, in VR virtual reality, you know, it may look like a compliment now, but maybe the idea is to, to foreclose and to detain some key technologies in what would become an, a, a new arena of competition, right? So I think to summarize the point I'm trying to make here is that perhaps distinguishing uh, in the sample that you have, if you can, not just direct and indirect competitors, but, you know, um, competitors in terms of, you know, makers of substitute products, but specifically identify complementors. I'm not sure that's, that's what's captured by indirect competitor here. I think it deserves its own characterization. And perhaps a third category, which is complements that could become substitutes in the future. So that's my second point. So the first point to recall was the level of analysis of this so-called life cycle. Are we talking about a product life cycle or an industry life cycle? What, what, what is it? And how can you demonstrate that it is? The second has to do with taking more seriously the difference between, between uh, uh, innovation in complements and innovation in substitutes. That latter point has a consequence, which is more of a sort of policy or big picture question, which is, uh, which should at least inform regulatory activity. Do we want as a society to be indifferent as to which kind of, of innovation happen. We say any innovation is good, whether it's on complement or whether it's on substitute and it's not the role of the regulator to look at this. Uh, or do we want to think, okay, we understand that the incumbents have a strong incentive to, uh, on the one hand, stimulate complementary innovation and on the other hand, suppress, uh, you know, uh, um, I'm sorry, so stimulate complementary innovation and suppress innovation that could become a substitute. Uh, and they, they are uh, the big tech companies uh, have the means to do so and the and the incentives to do so. Is the outcome of such of such uh, corporate activities a good one? And not just because the the startupers can maximize their exit strategy, but as a society, are we content with having uh, a small group of very powerful incumbents? who uh, have both the incentives and the means to become uncontested by a systematic acquisition. Uh, and so that I think is a big picture question, which I'm not sure this particular paper can answer, but I haven't seen any good answer in other papers as well. And it's almost as if we're skirting around the issue, you know, bending about the term, is it good for innovation or is it bad for innovation? So these are, uh, you know, a sort of a, a three comments. Um, other comments that I would have uh, in your slide when you look about you look at the influence of M and A on entry, uh, is this is this is this really the influence on entry? Is this a, is this the is this a causation or is this a, a correlation? I, I didn't quite understand that. So perhaps you can just very easily answer that. Yes, we have proved it's a causation. I didn't quite see that, um, and. Um, And uh, there is another point where you talk about signaling. You say that it is possible that uh, incumbent firms by acquiring um, acquiring startups, they are signaling that this, uh, that this is a, an area that is worth, worthy of investment and therefore they're good for innovation. Um, is this a deliberate signal, do you think? Or is this... Uh, I wasn't entirely sure whether there was a deliberate strategic intent there, or whether is it we are retrofitting after the fact some uh, some 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 cor correlation effect that maybe may be good or not. But 
that it, in, in the way you wrote it, it sounded like it was deliberate, but I wasn't entirely sure that that's what you meant. And I, I will stop here with, with my comments. I hope it's helpful. Great. Thank you very much, Annabelle. All right. Uh, so you got some great comments, uh, uh, Carmelo, and uh, I'm going to give you all of five minutes to respond briefly because I know we have others here that have comments for you. So can, if you'd like to, please go ahead. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I anticipated this. So that's why uh, I said, you know, that I was, uh, it was a, a luxury treat today. And um, I'm very happy about that. So um, I have a deck for other reasons, but, you know, this one will, will add to that, but uh, it's a good deck to have. Um, now, fantastic comments. And, um, and indeed, um, you know, lots of this is, is a, you know, part of our thinking and uh, it's, you know, uh, issues that uh, we have there to solve, but we don't know uh, as yet how to solve. And I was hoping, you know, to have some of the solutions um ready for this presentation but unfortunately it requires a lot more time um now I, I i'll go very i'll touch very briefly a few points because I, I want to hear also other discussion but very briefly um yes so uh lots of the thing um in uh, about is comment um we are thinking about that you know so how to address those and more you know on a robust analysis for the empirics just to name, you know, a few things that we already uh, been doing. Instead of comparing, you know, non uh, so GAFAM with non GAFAM, because correctly, as you said, yeah, I mean, who is non GAFAM, right? I mean, some of the companies out there may have, you know, equal power than GAFAM. So why just GAFAM, right? Um, uh, and and also, is this, you know, an, an un unaffected group or or a group that is not influencing the market? Clearly, they are also influencing the market. So. So we, we, would, we would like to have a cleaner um, reference point, right? And, and, and therefore we're doing something with synthetic group, uh, you know, control group. Uh, it, it's a methodology, you know, for those of you not familiar, it basically reconstructs an hypothetical counterfactual. So a group of companies uh, or, or, you know, in, in similar conditions at the starting point to which, you know, you will, you will basically compare to. But it's, you know, it's not as great things uh, there's also been some um you know uh negative things about this this methodology but so far it's one of the best to build a counterfactual empirically you know where otherwise you will not have the data to do that uh, unless you do you know analytical modeling which is not empirical on us so we're working on that and we're working also on the endogeneity issues which is yeah okay so is it you know, we're starting from at the moment from the assumption that we are looking at these companies and we are focusing on this because we assume, as, as, as also the say goes, that, you know, they are the one influencing the market and shaping the external market context. But what if, as you know, I said, I mean, they're also following the trend or trying to anticipate uh, or just follow up, you know, of what is going to be the trend of the new things. And so there are other events happening out there, they are, they are actually affecting their decision. Um, we don't have, you know, if that's the case, of, of course, we have an endogeneity problem here. But, 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 the, but, you know, but our dynamic estimation, which looks at leads and lags, so, you know, preceding period and, and, and post periods, is actually good in detecting if there is any trend there. And we see that, you know, in some of the, in some of the effects, there is indeed some anticipatory effect uh of the event right so this is not happening really you know overnight on the vacuum so we see some of those um software quite unique i agree with you we stick you know, to software for the reasons I, I i mentioned also to at this point to say something but but we have to look more distinguishing maybe you know separating uh some of the segments where you have more of those network effects story uh, that might actually play a role versus others where it's maybe you know more technology and see whether there is some demand based you know factors that influence also this prospects of entry or or new financing. Um, so that is a you know all good points you know to take home and do sub sub sampling analysis. And you know moving to Annabelle. Um, Thank you very much. And, and, and again, here you raise you know, a couple of uh, really burning points uh, where we are uh, grabbing our, our head around and trying to solve the issues. Uh, what is really the life cycle? Now, the reason why you know, it's not entirely clear in the text is because you know, 
uh, we haven't we haven't sorted out you know as clearly as yet. So you know that's reflected in the text, uh, besides the fact that you know has been written very quickly. Um, but you know the the it's 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 a question that I'm I'm, I'm pushing back you know uh, to to you and the audience. How should we think you know about this you know the uh, the, the life cycle and and the, the the evolution and you know the dominant design theory as you know applied to digital now contest right I mean so can we really say that I mean our idea here was to apply to the market technology market segment okay so uh, what is the technology market segment where is you know is the is, is basically the it's defined by the number of technologies that have that specific, you know, um, application of functionality at the moment. And, and that's why, you know, at moments we, we speak about technology trajectories, right? I mean, so it's not the entire software industry, but it's, you know, the segment within the software industry that, you know, where there are those hundred, you know, uh, new technologies, right? That are being founded, you know, one in 2000, one in 2010, whatever. So, you know, we see basically growing until, you know, some of this then emerge into a new maybe platform or, or even technology application. So that's how we are thinking about that. And we and that's how we are, we, we, we try to apply here, right? And going back to your car story, uh, yes, but, it, you know, if you think at the smart, if you think at the digital or electric now versions of the cars today, right? I would still consider that as being in the mature phase of the industry that is, you know, hundred more than hundred years old, or should we rather consider that as a specific now new segment, right, of the industry that might then eventually turn into something different than you know what we used to know as the car industry? Because of digital now, this has you know lots of different applications, and then the car in the future might not be any longer a product, might be something else, right? So if we think of this as you know a new potential starting point that can become something else, then we what we want to understand is the clusters of those technologies that are happening in the same period. So what are all the different design versions of these electric cars? You know, and what and where they can go, right? And then you know, uh, you know, they can take different trajectories. And that's how we're thinking about this, uh, and and we're working on finding some factors and some variables that allow us to, to have you know a better track of this cohort analysis you know over time right at the moment we are clustering basically all together around these three events but eventually we what we want to do is really sorting the different clusters right and see then you know what happens um, last point innovation in complements and substitutes amazing amazing point in fact I mean our idea of fetid A and B started with that in mind and then we figure out that with data we have, uh, we cannot clearly distinguish at this point with just the data we have um, on the, you know, which one are complements, which one are substitutes. But we can play with the similarities and, and we sort it into indirect, you know, competitors. But we have to now find a better, a clever way to uh, maybe not technology side, uh, draw these differences, right? I mean, are they complementing or substituting? the targets not uh, um, and so that there is a two-way also reference here one is are they complement or substance of the target company so the company that is interested invested by you know the incumbent and are they complement substitute to the incumbent's other you know uh, platform products because that's another layer right i mean we don't touch that layer at the moment so they can be just complement substance of the target company but with don't know anything whether these are complements or, or substitutes of the other products of the incumbent, which is, you know, the more salient question also for policy that you had in mind, probably. So we need to build this two layer measure, right, to be able to say anything um, uh, that speaks, you know, to that debate. But I stop here. Thank you very much. I mean, lots of uh, stuff to, to think about and uh, I'll leave, you know, to the, to the more general discussion. All right. So thanks. Thanks a lot. This is the end of the first part of our roundtable. Um, so once again, I want to thank Carmelo um, for sharing with us your preliminary paper.